The 2020 North Atlantic hurricane season was an extremely active and record-breaking event. The year concluded with a total of 30 named storms in the basin, which is the highest ever recorded. Despite this anomaly, the highlight of the year was in Louisiana. Louisiana was hit by three powerful hurricanes over the course of the year. In August, Category 4 Hurricane Laura struck the southwest side of the state. It was the most devastating storm of the year. It did $19 billion in damages and took the lives of 81 people. Just a couple months after Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Delta hit the exact same location in southwest Louisiana. Luckily, it was not nearly as strong at only Category 2 status. Even though the end of hurricane season was quickly approaching, it wasn't over. At the end of October, only a couple weeks after Hurricane Delta, Hurricane Zeta plowed through the southeast Louisiana coastline as a Category 3 hurricane. Louisiana also experienced a landfall from Tropical Storm Cristobal back in June, but luckily, impacts were minimal. Overall, these storms killed 96 people and did nearly $27 billion in damages. Large portions of coastal Louisiana were damaged if not completely destroyed, and many families were left heartbroken. It's now August 2021 and hurricane season is already back in full swing. Multiple tropical cyclones have already made landfall on the United States coastline, but thankfully none of them have been significant. It's only a matter of time until the peak of hurricane season arrives. This is the period in which the basin produces its most powerful storms, and with the events that occurred the previous year, many are feeling tense and unsettled. The day is now August 23rd, and the National Hurricane Center has issued a tropical weather outlook. These outlooks are issued every six hours and display areas where tropical development seems possible. In this specific outlook, an area of interest has been marked in the Caribbean Sea. On August 24th, satellite imagery revealed a cluster of thunderstorms in the Caribbean Sea. This is the tropical wave that meteorologists have been forecasting to develop. Around this time, the majority of forecast models are predicting a relatively weak tropical cyclone to form. However, in just a matter of hours, the situation began to worsen. Some of the model solutions were now forecasting a hurricane, and possibly a significant one. Trends like this are quite concerning, as they show the possibility of a strong hurricane, in this case, making landfall in the Caribbean or Gulf of Mexico. As the next couple of days went by, the tropical wave proceeded west and eventually approached Jamaica. By this point, the system was given a high chance of formation by the National Hurricane Center. On August 26, the National Hurricane Center confirmed the formation of Tropical Depression 9 just south of Jamaica. On the system's first official forecast, it already appeared obvious that the system would make landfall in Cuba and eventually move onshore in the United States as a hurricane. After causing minor damage and flooding issues in Jamaica, Tropical Depression 9 moved northwest and continued to intensify. By the end of the day on August 26, the system intensified to tropical storm status. Due to the upgrade, it was given the name Ida. During August 27th, Ida would proceed northwest, riding along the coast of Cuba. Minimal impacts would occur to the island during this time period. However, not everyone was in the clear. Tropical storm warnings were issued along the coast of western Cuba in preparation for the storm's arrival. As the sun was setting across the Caribbean Sea, and many people went to sleep, Ida was only waking up. It went through a phase of quick intensification and had become a borderline hurricane. Meteorologists quickly issued hurricane warnings for areas in western Cuba. Not long after the warnings were issued, Ida officially reached hurricane status. Ida inflicted some damage in Cuba, mostly to trees and weaker man-made structures, but overall impacts were relatively minimal. The Gulf of Mexico is a hot spot for tropical activity. The warm waters, moist air, and low wind shear offer perfect conditions for developing tropical cyclones. 
This kind of environment was going to allow Ida to rapidly intensify. The National Hurricane Center continued to issue advisories on the system as it entered the Gulf of Mexico. The newest forecast for the system showed something extremely concerning. The letter M was spread across the forecast cone. The letter M here represents major hurricane status. This is when a hurricane is category 3 or above or rather has sustained wind speeds of at least 115 miles per hour. On August 28th, Ida began taking advantage of the very favorable conditions in the Gulf of Mexico. It had a solid inflow of moisture and was wrapping deep convection around its center of circulation, leading to the formation of an eye. The continuing organization of the system caused it to be upgraded to Category 2 status with sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. With less than 24 hours remaining until landfall, the people in Louisiana were hard at work preparing boarding windows, filling sandbags, and some people even evacuated to get out of harm's way. No mandatory evacuation orders were called ahead of the storm due to lack of time. This was going to be a hard hit for Louisiana, especially after the previous year. As the sun set on August 28th, the entire United States watched in terror as Ida continued to rapidly intensify. The next morning would be a hell on earth for the people in Louisiana. On the morning of August 29th, 2021, shortly after sunrise, Hurricane Ida made landfall in southeast Louisiana as a high-end Category 4 hurricane. It peaked with maximum sustained winds of 150 miles per hour and a minimum central pressure of 929 millibars, the strongest hurricane to ever strike Louisiana. Conditions along the coast of Louisiana were nearly impossible to survive. Most of the houses and other man-made structures were completely destroyed. In order to see the impacts the Ida left on Louisiana, we will be using the street view on Google Maps. Here is an image of Toro Lane, Louisiana in November of 2019. Toro Lane is located in or just outside of Grand Isle, Louisiana. This is where Ida's eye wall moved on shore and caused the most significant damage. I will now put up a photo of Toro Lane prior to Ida's landfall, as you just previously saw. And now, here is an image of Ida's aftermath. And you can see that basically 90% of the structures on Toro Lane have been completely destroyed. Reduced to just their support beams, or even just remain as piles of rubble on the ground. It's a truly heartbreaking scene. Despite Ida's main impacts occurring along the coast of Louisiana, other areas in the southeast United States were also affected, not only with flooding and wind, but also tornadoes. Between August 28th and August 31st, 35 tornado reports were filed across Mississippi and Alabama. Tornado reports on this map are shown as red dots. Most of these tornadoes were likely weak spin-ups and caused minor damage. As a tropical depression, Ida continued heading northeast across Mississippi. By this point, it was just a big rainmaker for the eastern United States. Many areas were forecast to get at least six inches of rain, which was bound to cause widespread flooding issues. On the morning of September 1st, 2021, Ida's final advisory as a tropical cyclone was issued by the National Hurricane Center. The system transitioned into an extra tropical cyclone or rather, the remnants of its former self. However, despite its demise, Ida wasn't finished. It was preparing to make history again. September 1st was another big day. Ida was once again about to cause mass devastation. Ahead of the storm, the Weather Prediction Center issued a high risk of flash flooding across Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. The size of the high-risk zone was concerningly large and presented an extremely dangerous situation. Some of the towns and cities in the zone were at risk of getting close to, if not 10 inches of rain, 
And while this rainfall event was going to be historic for the Northeast states, it wasn't the only thing occurring. The Storm Prediction Center issued an enhanced risk of severe weather for the Mid-Atlantic region. While this kind of risk isn't too uncommon, a certain component of it was. An unusually high tornado threat was present. A few notable tornadoes have occurred in the Mid-Atlantic, but it's not what the region is known for. During the afternoon of September 1st, supercells began firing across southeastern Pennsylvania. A few of these cells went tornado warned and ended up producing significant tornadoes. Three EF2 tornadoes occurred near Oxford, Pennsylvania, Annapolis, Maryland, and Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. The line of developing storms proceeded east and eventually crossed the Delaware River. A few supercells developed in southern New Jersey and began tracking north. One of these supercells became dominant and would end up being the main event of the day. To the untrained eye, this may just appear to be a normal thunderstorm that you would typically see on radar. You may be surprised to find out that these pink pixels are not being caused by heavy rain, but rather debris from homes flying thousands of feet into the air. At 6.23 p.m., the town of Mullica Hill, New Jersey, was hit by a monster tornado. Tornado emergency for Bristol, Croydon, and Burlington. The National Weather Service in Mount Holly, New Jersey has issued a tornado warning for Central Mercer County in Central New Jersey, Northwestern Burlington County in Southern New Jersey, Southeastern Bucks County in Southeastern Pennsylvania until 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. At 7.02 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, a confirmed large and destructive tornado was observed over Beverly, or 12 miles southwest of Trenton, moving northeast at 40 miles per hour. Tornado emergency for Bristol, Croydon, and Burlington. This is a particularly dangerous situation. Take cover now. Hazard, deadly tornado. Source, radar confirmed tornado. Impact, you are in a life-threatening situation. Flying debris may be deadly to those caught without shelter. Mobile homes will be destroyed. Considerable damage to homes, businesses, and vehicles is likely and complete destruction is possible. Locations impacted include Trenton, Ben Salem, Ewing, Willingboro, Florence, Burlington, Bristol, Bordentown, Pennington, Beverly, Yardley, Tullatown, Langhorne, Washington Crossing, Windsor, Florence Roebling, Woodside, Edinburgh, Whitehorse and Andalusia. The sunrise of September 2nd revealed something that nobody wanted to see. A 13 mile long path of destruction was carved into southwest New Jersey. The town of Mullica Hill received significant damage. A large number of homes were severely damaged if not destroyed. This tornado was rated EF3 due to its extensive damage. The same supercell that produced this tornado went on to produce another tornado just a few miles south of Trenton. This tornado prompted the issuance of a tornado emergency, the first to ever occur in New Jersey. Thankfully, this tornado was much weaker and was only rated EF1 for its minor damage. Those who didn't get affected by the tornadoes weren't out of harm's way either. As expected, Ida caused a record-breaking and historic rain event across many states in the Northeast. Floodwaters caused many cars to become stranded on highways and in parking lots, subway systems to fill up with water, and unfortunately, many people drowned or died of other causes relating to the event. Thankfully, this was the end of Ida's wrath. The system quickly accelerated offshore, away from the United States, and finally, there was a moment of peace after four days of chaos. Ida will not be forgotten. <laughs>